Well, let's get started. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I, we're not going to be connecting with the Australians. I tried to set it up and it didn't quite work. It didn't happen. We had some technical and timing difficulties, but I promise you we'll do everything we can to get it working next week. And we will get us talking to the Australians. What we may do um, on Thursday, um, we may be giving you some preliminary stuff to start the communication off with you and the Australians. Some, some forms to fill in and to start some um, to start passing some information back and forth so we can start some collaboration with the Australian group. I promise you it will happen. We're trying really hard to get this to happen, but it's not easy. Um, not helped by the fact that I'm unconscious for days at a time either. But, um, what we're going to do today... Yeah. You can this front line. Um... But we're still going to go into this um, topic about um, that we discussed our perception of ourselves, particularly in relation to the online communities we work with. I still want to keep it very tied to the kind of discussions we've had, which have been great about the nature of self and the nature of the way we project ourselves with others and define ourselves and the, the readings we've been doing. But I'm going to take us into a slightly different area tonight. Um, some of you will have experienced a little bit of this in some of my other classes. So, I'll start with a question about the movie The Matrix. Now, I imagine that all of you have seen The Matrix. Anyone not seen The Matrix? I've only seen the first one. Oh, you haven't read it. Okay. I strongly recommend it. Strongly are, you, are you just talking about the very first one? The very first one. Yeah, the very first one. The first one. Yeah. In that movie, there's a certain scene where these people come and knock on his door when Neo is a, a computer hacker, and his computer tells him to follow the white rabbit, which is her tattoo. And Neo, as an underground hacker, is making these disks. We never really know what's on the disk. There's some sort of identity or... He's creating a forged identity. Now, this is the question. He hides his discs inside a book. In the movie, what book are those discs hidden in? You remember that, don't you? <laughs> he was in class when I asked this before. Anyone else remember? I'm just going to guess and say, like, Alice in Wonderland. Very close. It's an Alice in Wonderland analogy about the white rabbit, because he has to follow the rabbit down the hole, but no, it's not. Good guess. Go tell them, Matt. That's the relation with Sumo Prize. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and actually, it's, I have, because I looked in, I never looked into it, and I think the guy that wrote that book said, please don't ever make any correlation between us and that book. Yeah. <laughs> the guy that wrote that book, Baudrillard, yeah. Uh, Philosopher. So. <laughs> Even though he says don't make correlations, there are correlations. Yeah. You can't escape them. <laughs> they quote his book directly yeah. in the movie. I mean, <laughs> he can't get away from it. I think he meant to make an academic point. I don't know. Well, we're not, not going to do uh, much on that. I'm hoping some of these clips will play. I only pasted them in a minute ago. So. I'd like to play Thomas Anderson. Neo. I had to read Baudrillard, I had to read uh, Out of Control, which is about systems, evolution, and robots. And then there was another book which was uh, Evolutionary Psychology. Those were three books that they wanted me to uh, read before I opened up the script. So, most surprising That's thing. Okay. Like Obviously, the most surprising thing about that is the fact that Keanu Reeves can't actually read. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite surprised. Come on, Steve and the Matrix are great movies. It is a good movie, but, um, and he plays a great, he, he, he's, he's good in the Matrix, I'll agree. He's terrible in most other things, but he's good in the Matrix. But, um, so, even, even interviews with him, he says he had to read these books before they even uh, started interviewing him. So, I started interviewing him for the Play Matrix. Thomas Oops. Anderson. Stop that. So, um, what I want to do is show you the little um, 
there are lots of discussions about philosophy in this movie, and it's great to bring in something sort of talk pop culture and popular movie like this into it. Uh, let's bring this up. So I'm going to jump to a particular spot in this. Desert of the Real from Baudrillard, used in the Matrix, but to define the state of modern culture, where we are. And what's interesting there is they reference, well, they reference this, <coughs> whoops, this uh, short um, essay by, uh, by Bourges on the exactitude of science. And the idea is that in this empire, the art of cartography has attained such perfection that a map of a single province occupied the entirety of the city, and the map of the empire, the entirety of the province. In times, these inco unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the Cartographer's Guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire. So you create a map that's the size, same size as the thing you're mapping. And which coincided point, 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 point for point with it. The following generations who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears saw that the vast map was useless. And not without some pitilessness, it, it was was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters in the deserts of the west still today there are tattered ruins of that map inhabited by animals and beggars and this idea that what you end up with is two realities almost that kind of superimpose on each other now we have to think a little bit abstractly about this about what this means for us in our kind of way of living and how we live today, especially as I'm going to introduce now 
with the digital technologies we have every day around us, how it's changing us, how it's changing the map we live in. And by definition, changing us as people too. So, I, I like this little YouTube clip that gives a very simple, easy explanation of the three kind of levels that build a lot, hold a lot of things on. There's no text with this, so. We start thinking about a flight simulator. Something like a flight, uh, flight simulator can imitate something that exists like an aeroplane, or we can create a computer game and fly a dragon or a, a spaceship. Governed by laws of physics, which are real, or we can change those laws of physics. We can stretch the boundaries. So what Baudrillard says, so a simulacrum or a simulacrum is a representation that has multiple copies, identical copies, and represents something that does not exist apart from the technology used to create the representation. So let's see some examples. The movie Titanic, we have the real ship and we have this movie representation. And we can evaluate how good that copy is by comparing it. Avatar, we have no original, so we can't compare it to anything original. So here, the original is not something we would experience in our day to day or encounter in our day to day experience without the simulating technology. That applies to all sorts of things. The information you're getting through your phone, a simulating technology is creating that information that you're viewing. So, the original is a virtual model of code, most often a digital code. So we had simulation with analog technologies, creating discs of people singing. The performance was original, the discs were copies. Multi-track recording and studio effects I mean, it is possible to create music that the listeners never hear live. The final music does not exist apart from the recording and playback technology. Because we're adding in all these audio effects. So there was, in effect, no original. So, we have these three phases or orders of simulation. Before industrialism, where there was a distinction between what was an original and what was a copy, the Industrial Revolution made it possible to create ident factory production, mass production. We can now create copies of things and we can't tell the difference between an original and a copy. And today, we have this new thing where we have simulation that can be more important than originals. This is where people argue with him, I think it's fair to say. Um, but it's a very, it's a nice way to think about the way we live in today, where the media, this is what he's usually talking about here is media. Um, particularly computer generated media is more, the things we're seeing and the things we're producing are more important than the original. So a song that goes through all the, the editing process is more important than the original track that was laid down in analog. So can we, can we find a word, different words for more important? Or, hmm? I, I'm just I'm just stuck a little bit stuck on the notion of importance here. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what what he begins to say is that real, the the reality doesn't exist anymore. And what I think the way he puts it in the paper is that. 
reality ceasing to exist and we are living in the simulation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what this is meaning by more important. Right, it's, it's, that's going to cause some problem in the, uh, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grammar of degree. Yes. And, I, and, and the grammar of degree is often going to posit some real. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, the term what, important so probably is. It's just a little tricky there. So we, we, when we start talking, we might want to be careful about that phrase. Okay. A little bit. Fair play. I hadn't noticed that, but yeah. That's no, okay. So this is the pre-industrial idea, clear distinction between an original idea. So this idea of a key is the example they use, where we can make a key by hand, and it can be copied, but you could still tell which was the original. Um, we move into the next stage of industrialism, where we can create identical copies. So keys again, we now with the manufacturing plant can't tell the difference between the original and copies of a key. And where are we now with keys? Digital passcode is an interesting concept of that. You may use the same numerical code for different banks and your access code to the door of your um, uh, university uh, building. And you may use it on different alarms, you may use that code on websites as well. But there's no physical key, only this virtual code. And that model or code in your head is more important than the original set of numbers. It's more important again. Uh, again. Yeah, 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 problem. But what, what he's saying is that the model or code has superseded, is probably a better word, than the original code. So, what we say is that representations precede and shape our real life experiences. So, this simulator. Baudrillard believes it's important that what's it, what's it, what he says is that the user experiences the simulation as if it's real. So we have things we do in our life. Don't just think about simulators. Think about all the ways you get media bombarding you. Um, and we experience this as if it's real and not as if it exists without the simulation. So whether a simulation feels real, he does, he gets, the more important crops up all the time here, I'm noticing it now. Okay. So whether a simulation feels real, or whether it's an accurate copy of something that exists outside the simulation. There's a good example here, that, there you go. So, he wrote this essay called Did the Gulf War, uh, the Gulf War did not take place. And he's not, argue, he's not arguing that the Gulf War didn't take place. He's talking about how we saw the Gulf War take place. Um, simulations preceded and shaped people's experience of the war. So all of the pilots and the people who pressed buttons to send bombs did it through simulation. Everything they saw, they saw through cameras. So, <laughs> it never really happened in terms of the real for them. There's an argument that it all happened through a simulation. And so, it, and it's a very interesting kind of place to discuss how we experience the world. It took place through simulators, cockpit pilots, experience, and which had more to do with representations than actual or mediated experiences of the real. And even the real experience that anyone, if anyone had a real experience of interaction, that experience was shaped and changed by the simulations. So, Where I'm going with this, and what I want to do, so this is just a summary of the same thing.
from a transhumanism standpoint, what I, what I want us to start getting into today, um, before we go any further, I'm going to show you two, um, I'm going to put these up online, uh, two copies of the same, the same, they have different titles, but I'm pretty sure this is just the first section of this one. I think the procession of Sumatra and Sumatra and Sumatra. Uh, this is a book, and that was a chapter. It's a chapter from this book, and so, and the, I'm pretty right certain. There. Yeah, it's the first, yeah. It's the first but, chapter. But this is, and what is this? This is. This is most of the book. So. This is the. This is the. This was an earlier translation. Okay. So this is this. No, this, but this is, is a joint reverend. I mean, this was translated in 2012. Yeah. And this was done in the, in the 80s or 90s. Okay, so look, I've never really bothered about which translation of this I've read, but well, I guess I should. It's, just, it's, just, it's, the, it's the same problem of a copy. Yeah. Is, is a translation a copy of an original? Or is a translation... A simulation. A sim oh, yeah. I think it's interesting to share and thing to uh, groundbreaking here, but in my first, or in my bachelor's degree, I studied um, history, and what we learned in history is that any story um, that you hear through history, it's kind of like what you're explaining, where um, it's shaped by how that individual experienced it, and then they'll record it, you know, retell it, but then, so they make a copy, basically, of what they experienced. They'll tell it to somebody, that person interprets it, and then retells it, so then the second retelling is kind of like a copied experience of the first experience. And so by the time you, you know, or writing your own paper as an undergrad, you actually have like all these recycled copies, I guess, of the original experience. And the best way to, um, a good example to kind of go off of that is um, a lot of history, you would think that there were no women in history, but it's because all the stories that were recorded and told that seemed important, that the things that like were molded by society back then were because, you know, men were, it was a patriarchal society. So um, history in general has been kind of um, simulated, I guess, to, to look like women basically didn't even exist. So I think it's kind of, it's an interesting um, comparison, I guess I made with what you're talking about. But this, it's perfect, perfect uh, <laughs> idea. It's a, nice, it's a nice carryover from, so this philosophy of Bodeiris is looking at uh, things like commodities and products to disciplinary activity. So, uh, your comment about history and mind about translation are basically taking the same dynamic and applying it to uh, our habits of thought. So it's a very good, it's a very apt comment. <laughs> Absolutely. I will be, I'll be putting two translations of the first chapter. Uh, well, one will be the whole book and one of the first chapter um, of Simulcra and Simulation up on there. And then you can copy it and do it what you want. Yeah, <laughs> you could have your own copy. You make your own translation. Now, the two translations I have, I absolutely love the second one. Uh, the first one is, as you said, it's translated from the 1930s. It's a very academic, dry read. But it is a fascinating read. I, yeah, before doing this course, I was saying I haven't read, read a lot of philosophy. I read this. And, it, it did change my way of thinking about the world when I read it. I, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. But this one, the second one, is translated from English to American. <laughs> now, I'm going to apologize because there's a lot of swearing in it. It's obviously written for American college students. Um, the first line of it is, you think you understand the fucking real man? Try this shit on <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a couple of examples which I think are really lovely. Uh, but there's some great... It's actually a really entertaining read and it covers all of the important concepts. It is a translation. It's got the concepts. And so, in the same way, the pretext of saving the original, one forbade... In the same way with the pretext of saving an original, one forbade visitors to enter the Loiseau Caves. Uh, these are the old cave paintings, the stone cave paintings. 
but an exact, exact replica was constructed 500 meters from it so that everyone could see them. One glances through a peephole at the authentic cave and then one visits the reconstituted, reconstituted hall. It is possible that the memory of the original grotto is itself stamped in the minds of future generations, but from now on there is no longer any difference. The duplication suffices to render both artificial. Yeah, it's really interesting that we are building replicas. Uh, this paper talks a lot about Las Vegas and Disneyland, which replicate Paris and you know um, how the Americans. Most people in America, their vision of Paris is from Las Vegas. You know, so it's a fascinating paper, really. Um, this is how it's written in the translation. When you try to save an original by making a copy, you make both of them artificial. Everyone knows about the cave paintings in Loiseau, those fancy doodles by cultures from way back, <laughs> when who coloured buffalo goats and other primitive shit all over the walls. <laughs> People visiting the cave started to breathe too much, which started to ruin the artwork. So what did modern society come up with? They build a fucking replica 500 meters, <laughs> which are a little bit bigger than yards away. I love the way they translate meters for the Americans. <laughs> you can now, that's my, why my wife wouldn't come and live in Australia. She said they got the metric system. I'm not going. <laughs> you can now visit the caves and peek through a tiny hole at the original, then take a tour of the replica. It's impossible to describe how fucking retarded this is. <laughs> <laughs> Future generations will end up remembering the copy more than the original, so both are kind of useless now. Bands covering songs has more or less the same effect. The first time I ever heard a live recording of Dave Matthews' band doing All Along the Watchtower, I pretty much decided that I suddenly hated the shit out of Bob Dylan. <laughs> so he puts in more cultural references, and it's just a great ring the way it's done. One more example I really like. So, he says, just as with ethnology which plays at ex extracting itself from its object to better secure itself in a pure form, de I love this word, demuseumification is nothing more than a <coughs> artificiality. Witness the cloister of San Michel de Cuxa, which one will repatriate at great cost from the cloisters in New York to reinstall it in its original site. And everyone is supposed to applaud this restitution. So they're taking a chapel that was in New York and putting it back in France. Um, well, if the exportation of the cornices was in effect with an arbitrary act, if the cloisters in New York are an artificial mosaic of all cultures, following the logic of the capitalist centralization of their value, their reimportation to the original site is even more artificial. It's a total simulacrum that links up with reality through a complete circumvolution. The cloister should have stayed in New York in its simulated environment, which at least fooled no one. Repatriating it is nothing but a supplementary subterfuge, acting as if nothing had happened, and indulging in a retrospective hallucination. Great sense of language, but, but it is a bit hard to read. Here we have this, this is great. Museums are artificial reality, deal with it. <laughs> There's a museum in New York called the Cloisters in Fort Tyron. The actual cloister, a big fucking courtyard, along with many others, was reassembled brick by brick in the 1930s for, for the fucking knows what. And in the 1980s, the museum announced they're going to return, return the whole thing at the cost of Jesus Christ, that's a lot of dollars, <laughs> to its original place. Why was it moved in the first place? <laughs> and we're also forced to applaud this, which is identical to science returning specimens to the wild. Guess what? The cloister and the savage are already dead. Moving the cloister back is even stupider than having moved it offside in the first place. And it becomes even more artificial. This is a total simulacrum, where the idea of it even referencing anything whatsoever is completely ridiculous. I like the way it makes it so clear, you know, the idea of referencing. It, it is well written. This is exactly like the part in Wayne's World, where Wayne and Garth are about to shoot their first corporately sponsored episode, and the producers have reproduced the basement from Wayne's parents' house exactly in the television studio. 
God looks down from the sound booth and says, guys, it's like looking at Wayne's basement, only it's not Wayne's basement. <laughs> <laughs> so they nailed it. That ties in perfectly with the image of the map. <laughs> yeah, the board map, you know, the same. And I get a map of the same size as the original. You know, it becomes the real. So, um, anyway, I'll put both of these on. I think I can guess which one you're likely to read. <laughs> Somebody make this, but for Heidegger. <laughs> you do, actually. It would be good. I, I agree. So... This is the question uh, I want to open with today. We may, but we'll probably continue this on Friday with more discussion. Uh, I'm probably going to talk a little bit today. And then we'll, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, we'll finish this off. Ask the I have a question to ask, and then we'll open for discussion and continue on uh, Thursday. Yeah, sure. That's okay. So this is where we start to relate. It. Sorry, go on. Are we going to meet the on Tuesday, next Tuesday, I, I, you came in late, I explained we had some difficulties. I tried very hard, it didn't work out, but we will work on our utmost to get it on Tuesday. Okay? <clears throat> Here's an idea. Reality B is disappearing and your mobile phone is to blame. Saying I love my phone is beyond understatement. It's like saying that I love my record collection, and coffee, or pants. Stop and go. I don't know what went on there. Let's try on here. Here's an idea. Reality is disappearing, and your mobile phone is to blame. Saying that I love my phone is beyond understatement. It's like saying that I love my record collection, coffee, or pants. It's such an inextricable part of my life. I can't imagine what I'd do without it. I mean, I'd be fine, but sort of like without pants, I'd feel a little naked. I love being able to find restaurants, get directions, use Twitter, send emails, take pictures. Oh yeah, I'd like make phone calls. No, but really, think about it. How often do you use your phone as a phone in comparison to the other billion things that it does? Just take a look at mobile phone advertisements. They advertise recording, documenting, sharing, personalization, productivity, aloofness, disinterest, disconnectedness, the mediated experience of everyday life. The mediated Wait, experience. What are you talking about? All right. Mobile phone ads rarely show people actually making phone calls. It's all this girl at the concert, these guys with the dots, this phone that is you, these people who aren't even looking at one another. These people experience the world, their lives, through a phone. Their friends, even their cells, are transformed into the information transmittable by their i moto sun bovary. And because it's advertising, they have a great time while they do it, and are very attractive, and very well dressed, and the language of advertising is another video entirely. But the point being that while it might be weird, there is probably a grain of truth. We use our phones constantly for everything. They are great and helpful and make us more powerful. You can use the is awesome and important. But there is a difference between technology as utility and technology as lens. Like, let's say you're at a Nickelback show and you're taking photos, like the whole time. Are you really even at the show if all night long there's a screen between you and this piece of People do move behind you and French post-structuralist philosopher and all-around perfect Jean Baudrillard might say, no. no. In Simulacra and Simulation, Baudrillard talks about Jorge Luis Borges' extremely short story, on exactitude in science. In it, Borges describes an empire which has made a map, quote, whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. Over time, the impossibly large map becomes part of the landscape. Representation and thing being represented become confusingly one and the same. For Baudrillard, this is an imperfect but beautiful allegory for the simulation, and what he calls hyperreality. A reality constructed of images, some of which might be your child Kroger, which represent but also mask the real, Baudrillard says, has been murdered by an endless stream of images. He had a knack for the dramatic. Simulation is the process which creates hyperreality, the new real. Baudrillard writes that the real is produced from miniaturized cells, matrices, and memory banks, models of control, and can be reproduced an indefinite number of times from these. Welcome to the desert. Oh. Is any of this ringing a bell? Like, when you look at photos of Chai on your phone, are you fondly remembering the show, or are you consuming the Empire's map of it? And when you share those photos, like those people are constantly doing on those advertisements, are you sharing an experience, or are you sharing an idealized reference, 
some kind of empty symbol? Is your experience of a sunset still the same if your strongest reaction is, oh my god, you guys, that is some good Instagram? Are people still people if they're expressed solely by SMSs, Foursquare notifications, tweets, or status updates, or worse yet, solely by YouTube videos? I mean, how am I not myself? 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 I not myself? <laughs> okay, I'll admit that some of this seems a little alarming. Screens and digital representations of things are everywhere. If we didn't want to experience the world this way, we wouldn't, right? Phones, tablets, computers, video games, they all contribute to this hyper-reality. And we seem to be doing just fine. We still relate to one another, have personal experiences, and senses of self. I am a golden god! And we're just bored, which is great, because people hate being bored. Being bored stinks. And also, we're more connected and more knowledgeable. That can't be all bad. Well, the point might not be that this arrangement is bad. Rather, that it's different, majorly different. Recording, living, capturing, experiencing all happen constantly alongside one another. Thanks, in no small part, to mobile phones. And it's only becoming easier, or as Baudrillard might say, more seductive, to think of real life as images on a screen. To combine the map and the thing being mapped. Because it's more convenient, less risky and challenging, it's cleaner, more attractive, it looks, as a matter of fact, a lot like a cell phone commercial. What do you guys think? Are the things you experience on your phone real life? Let us know in the comments. And if you're not taking pictures of Chad Kroger right now. So this video is assuming it was too much, like that Nickelback is actually good. No, they're not assuming it's good, it's ironic. <laughs> so here's the question that we will now discuss. So <clears throat> this is uh, from the philosophical paper. Um, discussing Baudrillard's thought, thoughts on media. Um, just in this introduction, he says who Baudrillard is and his thoughts, and this is what we've just been saying over and over, the territory of the real no longer precedes the map, is precedes a better word and more important. Precedes. Yeah, probably is. No longer precedes the map of representation. Better way to say it. So, this is the paragraph I want to open up to you. Something has disappeared, the softer indifference between <coughs> maps and territories that constituted the charm of abstraction, is what Baudrillard writes. The real is producing these miniaturized cells, matrices, and memory banks, models of control. It can be reproduced an infinite number of times. And it no longer oops, needs to be rational, so that's what we just said. So, here's a question. In the past, a real moment occurred when a person experienced another person's presence and speech, or observed something happening in the neighborhood or across the street. That still happens. But he says, what we see today, what we experience more and more, is spectacles, images, signs, and symbols. To understand to what a great degree we've all become dependent on circuitry and networks, try living a week without the media, the PC, the TV, the mobile phone. This deprivation could be equivalent to an emotional and psychological death. So removing the map, perhaps. And so the question is, for us, what does this do to us as human beings? How does this change us? We're trying to say, talk about transhuman and technology changing us, and this is the fundamental question we're asking, I think. How is technology changing our experience? And I do, I, I am proposing that this gives us a kind of framework to talk about it. Yeah? A different framework to talk about it than we've used before. So how about that? I'm introducing philosophy for a change. Any thoughts on that one? Go on, Patricia. We've been reading a lot about augmented reality recently because of currently narrating a project on augmented sorry, reality. Sorry, say that again, sorry. I've been doing a lot of reading about augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that I've read recently that's kind of interesting is just about how people, you know, you want to capture pictures and, you know, the video for you to remember it. But, like, we don't realize you're doing is, like, let's say there's a meteor shower outside and you are like, oh my god, this is gorgeous, and you want to just take a bunch of pictures of it. You're not you know, actually experiencing it for yourself. You're, tr you're trying to get, you know, pictures of it to remember it for later. So you're going to look back and be like, oh, that was beautiful through the pictures, not necessarily from what you saw. And um, I think that 
you know, that kind of sounds negative, but then when you think of the word augmented, you want to, usually the word like augmented, fragmented reality, seems like it's doing something for it, you're getting something extra out of it. But, I don't know, I think when you look at it, like, from what you're actually losing, that doesn't seem like you're really augmenting the reality at all, to me. Well, Bobby, you saw it last night. People stood there with cameras. We were we were at the same concert last night, and the people in front of us we could we could see the band, and there was this these rows of screens that people were holding up in front of the band. Yeah, people watch watch. Now, many of them could have been watching the band and holding it to one side, but most of them were watching the screen. You know, watching it through a screen. Um, I do. I do question though the term augmented reality because the augmentation process is not the act of watching the event through the screen, it's what you do with it afterwards. Right. So well, I, I wanted to bring up the, the word augmented though because of when we were talking before about um, one of the articles we had to read was about um, in general, if you, you know, the thing that we talked about with if you have um, a vision deficiency but you get LASIK, you're bringing yourself up to that threshold from like a deficiency and if you, you know, were to get super like x-ray vision, then you're augmenting yourself. And from what we read in that article, it was just, there's this negative connotation that's always associated with augmenting things, apparently. And now it's harder for society to accept the augmentation of things by the use of technology. So I'm not, I'm not putting augment, uh, augmented reality or any sort of like simulation down. I mean, me and Carly, our project, we're trying to find ways to use augmented reality for education and, you know, to help children comprehend and learn. So I think there is, um, I think good can come from it. I just think it's interesting that it's always this kind of negative idea of using technology to augment an experience or to augment yourself is this negative thing. I'm going to throw this one back to you then. So you and Carly have a poster request tomorrow, which you all go and see, mm -hmm. because that poster is almost empty. It just has a few small images on it. And what you do is you hold an iPad over those images and little videos play to tell you about what they did. Yeah? Very cool. But that's a model, uh, that's a, a map, that's a simulation, that's not your real poster. <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's the real poster? Where's the real poster? Yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of want to get away from that, not that. Yeah, I, I had another thought. You, I mean, I'm behind this camera all class, and most of the time I end up especially looking at you guys through this lens instead of looking at you, because if I pay attention to people, I start missing things with the camera, I start forgetting that everybody else is talking, and that uh, I'm not focused, this isn't focused on them as I am. So I don't really know how to describe it, but there's definitely the disconnect that I have with this during class. But throughout our lives, we're experiencing our interactions more and more with people through those screens. Mm -hmm. So it, you're saying you've got a disconnect here with the class and you're sitting right there. How is that transferring to things we're doing in our lives and how is it changing us, transhuman, we are changing us? So help me understand your point about attention. If you're paying attention to what we're talking about, you're saying that you're then forgetting about moving the camera? Sometimes, yeah. yeah. I, I get involved in maybe f the more of the physical aspect rather than remembering to point the camera at people when they're talking instead of, it's, it's like I have to, I'm already focused, so I kind of think that this is already focusing. Oh, okay. Because okay. I'm, usually if I'm paying attention enough, I've, I'm watching, maybe like over here, I look at, down here, go up and down and listen, but if something happens to kind of pop up over here, then my mind is connected, and so I think that this should be connected too. So there's a little bit of lag time between the time that your own mind focuses mm -hmm. in another a location. Mm -hmm. Like I just missed half of Trish. Just now. <laughs> Sorry. Should we have just repeat work? Which you just said. Well, no, she can, she can relive the experience digitally. Oh, it should happen on the camera. Yeah. It, 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 if, yeah. you, if you were able to record it, but if not, you would have to go back and just do the physical action if we have the voice. Sorry, this is ridiculous. But, but I was interested in 
where the, the, the break in your attention would happen. So it, it seems like initially what you're describing is that your attention is sort of unified and focused through the camera. And something happens to break that. Mm -hmm. And then it takes, there's a little bit of a lag time to bring those things back into sync. Yeah. And I was interested in that, in that process of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. I mean, we, you could, we could talk about that quite academically in that break. Um, the term, the sort of terms we'd use in gaming and media and culture. What, what would you say about it from it's diegetic, that you're mm -hmm. non-narrative, being involved in a kind of continuous narrative and you have things that interrupt that experience, um, subtitles or in an old black and white movie. But those things that are interrupting are just other narratives, right? Not always, not oh, always. Okay. I mean, in computer games, you may have menu screens coming up where you're stopping the game and changing something and then going back into it. Okay. Still part of the game experience, but you're interrupting that flow. And it, it happens in everyday life as well. We have something going on and something mm -hmm. interrupts. Um, you know, you're in the process of doing something and you have to type the code in the door. Mm -hmm. It interrupts what the flow of something you're doing. Right. And that shift in perspective is, is uh, sometimes described as a shift from just being uh, having things functioning in a, in a totality of experience. And then when that shift happens, something becomes objectively present. That's right. And yeah. uh, that, that shift, we'll talk more about that, uh, maybe. I've said enough about it earlier mm -hmm. in other classes. But uh, we, we should probably talk a lot about how, it, how that shift to the objective presence uh, plays out in relationship with, to a screen. That would be an interesting conversation at some point. I'm very interested in people talking about how they feel their lives are different and how they themselves are different to what they're you know, doing. But Tom, you yeah. wanted to say you were not you your hand up for a while. So. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm just sort of, I, I guess this question has sort of been formulating in my head about, um, because there, there seems to be a negative connotation here with, uh, with like simulator. I, I think it was said that you know he's we've essentially I forget what the quote was but we've essentially murdered the real, the yeah real. the real um, but couldn't you say um, by going into a simulation uh, some some sort of uh, simulation of I'm gonna throw throw something out that I've sort of been been working around in my mind and might want to pursue in grad school just the notion of um, Serious games as potential, uh, like positive psychology or positive, you know, like as part of you know mental health therapy and things like that. Like being able to take patients that are you know depressed or don't know what they're what they're doing with their lives or whatever, and put them, you know, have them go through some sort of you know simulated narrative or whatever, and perhaps find answers. Like, isn't that an example of wouldn't that, wouldn't that be an example of a simulation um, sort of actually aiding the real? Uh, yeah, it is, I, and it's changing. Um, I did work in the labs. Um, I, I was a good person to do this. The labs I worked in in England, we did a version therapy with virtual reality models. So people who had extreme phobias of something, say you're, if you were scared of spiders, we would put you in a virtual reality environment with spiders. You knew there were no spiders there, but it was a way to build up your kind of tolerance of spiders. And I was very good to do that because I used to keep them breed tarantulas. So, yeah. But um, we, people who were scared of heights, we put them on high buildings and let them walk around high buildings, things like that. So we used to build those things. Uh, Did you have good results? Mm -hmm. what kind oh, of yeah, yeah they, they have very good results. It, it's a very popular technique. Um, but the question here is, you are changing that person through that experience. And what I think is a bigger question is the more insidious ways that the society, every day, we, don't, we, we buy into this technology with mobile phones and computers and the media and everything going on around us. 